Happy Father's Day to all the dads. If there ever was a Father's Day, we were tempted to skip church. It was today. I mean, after 90 degree weather all week, and then it's like perfect right now outside. And so I said, God, if any dad show up, please let me bless them <laughs> for their effort today because it would be an easy day to be a lot of other places. And I know that's why you're in the first service because you're going to go do something else. And that's great. I want you to. I hope you'll enjoy your day. And uh, we were talking last night and, and you know, up until this year, um, Father's Day was kind of mine. But both my boys, my son and my son-in-law both had kids this year, so <laughs> We got to share now. I was like, I don't know if I like that, but uh, actually I do. I'm so proud of them. And, and I told them last night we were talking about what we we're going to do. They're all looking at me. I said, hey, it's not just my day anymore. You guys got to help. So uh, but it's pretty cool. And I think, Matt, you'd agree. It's pretty cool when your boys have some kids and they're now they're dads. So no pressure. We'll see if they how much more they love us today. That's what it's all about. So Greatest title I have. Is that of being Bryden's dad or Auburn's dad? And I've said that for years. But I remember when we first moved to, to Lima, and of course, I didn't, we didn't know anybody. And at the time, the kids were going to Temple Christian. And there were several of those little guys, especially, you know, third, fourth grade when they got here. And, and they'd say, hey, Bryden's dad, Bryden's dad. They didn't know your name, so you're just Bryden's dad. And I was like, I like that. It's got a ring to it. It's the first time I'd ever heard it. And... Uh, or Auburn's dad. But it's more than just being a, a title. I remember when Bryden was born, uh, we didn't know what we were going to have. It was kind of one of those things that, you know, we were trying to be old-fashioned and not know. And, and uh, so, the, you know, when Bryden was born, a doctor goes, Mr. Davis, you got a boy. I'm like, it's a boy. She goes, yep, it's a boy. I was like, it's a boy. Because, again, I'm the last of the Davis lineage. Just it. It stops with me. If I don't have a boy, it's over. No pressure, son. You got a girl. You still got work to do. And uh, finally, the third time I asked, she opened his little legs. and goes, look, sir, it's a boy. I was like, it's a boy. Ah! You know, going crazy. And Marisa's laughing at me. And then uh, a little later, he's in the nursery. And I'm standing at the nursery. And I call my dad. I'm like, dad, you just can't believe how much I love him. Oh, dad, dad, dad. And I tell him all about it. And he let me go on. And finally he goes, son, hold on a second. He goes, how old are you? 27. He goes, now you got a little clue how much I love you. Wow. I'll never forget that, Roger. I thought nobody had ever experienced what I was going through. Because at times my dad had to be a dad. And it didn't feel very loving, <laughs> right? It had to crack the whip, make me work, and I wanted to go play. But I'll never forget that conversation. It's like it opened up a whole new level of understanding of, wow, mom and dad really do love me. Now, kids, hear me today. You don't totally understand Real love till you have a kid. And then you understand, wow, my parents feel like that about me. Now, now, it's a great feeling. It's a great thing. But how many of you know that kids don't come with an instruction manual? I looked everywhere. I didn't change his poopy diapers very often. But I even checked down there. There was nothing. Not a thing, not a book. I said, Lord, I'm going to need some help. <laughs> and then I looked in the Bible, and, and there's two scriptures that speak to fathers about their kids. Now, there's, there's more, but th there's two that kind of give instruction. There's a bunch of instruction in the Bible on how to raise kids. Uh, you can go to Proverbs, point your kids in the right direction, and when they're old, hopefully they won't depart from it, right? I mean, that, that's a good family Bible scripture, but it's not necessarily just to dads. But one of them's in Ephesians 6, 4, and it says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. There's a lot in there. But when I looked up exasperate, because I'm thinking, what does that really mean? To cause irritation or annoyance to, uh-oh, <laughs> I 
I might have done that. <laughs> to excite the anger of and rage. <laughs> oh, boy. I should have read that a little closer earlier. That one scripture says, you know, talking about God giving good gifts. If your kid asks for, for some bread and you give them a snake, I'm like, I might do that. I mean, that's just kind of who I am. And, and so part of that is kind of funny. And I think in a funny sense, yeah, we, we annoy our kids. You know, you want to wear their dress socks to the basketball game with your shorts on. You know, so they, Dad, please, come on, you know. But this isn't talking about it. This is talking about that you would live in such a way that your kids grow up angry. Most dads don't want to do that. Colossians 3.21 says, Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. To embitter is to excite bitter feelings in, to make bitter. Man, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want my kids to grow up bitter. I mean, I annoyed them and picked on them because I want to make them laugh. I want them to have some fun. I would never want to be the dad that would cause my kids to feel bitter towards life. And now think about this. Two scriptures of instruction. Really? Hmm. Now, like I said, there's many more scriptures about raising our kids, but there's two that are specifically towards the fathers. But the challenge of everything that I just shared in the opening of this service it's skewed by my own personal experience. And that's what we pastors do. Lori spoke to this on Mother's Day. I had a dad that loved me. I had a dad that raised me right. Now at 15, he went AWOL for a while. And, and, and the story I told earlier is when dad and I really started healing our relationship, when I had a son... I wanted that connection with my dad back, no matter what. And that's what sparked in me to let go of the pain, maybe the bitterness, some of the enrage that I'd become because he had abandoned me. But having my own kid caused me to say, you know what? I'm not living like this the rest of my life because that's going to reflect on me raising my kid. And I had to give it up. And I had to forgive. And I had to move on. Now, folks, not everybody can do that. Some of you had a dad that wasn't very nice. You had a dad that maybe abused you, wasn't kind, wasn't there, was AWOL from the time you were born. I, I get that. So that's why I say everything I just shared is kind of skewed. But for us dads that are here today, I think in your heart of hearts, regardless of your past, regardless of yesterday, you want to be a great dad or good dad and so I want to speak to you and encourage you that so so some of you as you sit here there's all kinds of feelings about Father's Day maybe maybe you feel as a father you failed miserably and you didn't get it right and and you don't really feel like you need to be recognized or prayed for listen to me I don't care where you've been I want to know where we're going and we can do better from today do not beat yourself up over yesterday. And, and for those of you that Father's Day brings some bad memories and you really don't want to think about it because your dad wasn't that great, let God heal you today. I read, a, I read a quote this morning. Two of the most significant moments in any person's life are the day they accept the Lord and the day they forgive their father. It's like, wow. Never heard that before. And this is from a young black man who lives in a culture where only 33% of black Americans grow up with both parents in the home. 33%. There could be a lot of father wounds in our African American culture. But that's what he wrote today. And I thought, wow, that's pretty significant. This last week, I happened to look on Fox News one day, and, and there's a, a 
former NFL football player, again, a black man, and he's speaking to this whole cultural thing of, of black homes not having daddies, and he's calling men to fatherhood, and I mean, he's challenging men that, hey, you know, it's time to man up and be the dad and show up, and, and uh, but he said in America, there are 18.5 million fatherless children in America. That's a lot of kids with no dad. No fishing, no hunting, no camping, no football games, no throwing in a ball in the backyard. Wow. Children who live absent from their biological fathers are on average at least two to three times more likely to be poor, to use drugs, to experience educational, health, emotional, and behavioral problems to be victims of child abuse, and to engage in criminal behavior than their other peers who live with their married, biological, or adoptive parents. In our community, there are a great deal of children without a dad or a mom or a dad in the home, and it affects those children. I'll never forget, I got to meet Coach Tim Goodwin when I first moved out to Allen East, and, and some of you know Tim, he's the coach at Marion Local High School. I think he's won 11 state championships now. But when I met him, he was at like number five. And Tim's a, an Allen East kid. His dad was a principal and coach for years, so he grew up right. And, and uh, when I was talking to him, I said, Tim, what's the secret to your success, man? And he goes, well, Randy, it's not going to be anything you're thinking of. He said, I'd love to tell you it's my great coaching skills and everything. He said, but the truth is at Marion Local, every night my kids go home to both parents 92% of them. I was like, what? He goes, yeah, top that. He goes, at Allen East, it's about 48%. I was like, what? He goes, true story. He had the stats to back it up. And he goes, and if you don't think that makes a difference, when I call dad or mom and I say, hey, Johnny, skipped out of practice today. <laughs> I need him to come run some laps. If mama don't make him, daddy does. And if that don't work, grandmama's on one side down the street this way and the other grandmama's this way. And grandpa, too, he says, somebody's kicking their tail, tell them, get to the practice and run some laps. He goes, you don't get that everywhere, Randy. I thought, wow. And I guess that whole county, you know, all them great football schools, it takes discipline to be a great football team. And all of us, the whole county, it's over 80% of all those people stay married. What's different about them? I don't know. Dads, we need to hear this. We need to fight for our family, not give up. If the destiny of our kids and the success that we hope for is determined by this, we need to work on this. Now, for those of you that have already been divorced, and all, I'm, folks, I'm not here to beat people up. I'm here to catch us where we're at today, and how can we get better going forward? Please hear that. I'm not trying to, 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 to guilt people or make people feel bad. I want to help us where we're at get better at where we're headed. I've told the story many times, but I got to go to Breckenridge, Colorado with author and teacher Josh McDowell. And after a couple of days there, he said, Randy, do you love your kids? I said, dude, I love my kids with all my heart. He goes, you know the number one way to show love to your kids? What's that, Josh? Got a pen and paper, you know. I think he's going to give me a prescription of stuff. And he simply said, love their mama. Oh. <laughs> Second thing? <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> he said, the number one way to show love to your kids, love their mama. Think about it. Some people say it's not right to stay married just for the kids. Really? Did you hear those stats? It's pretty serious. And folks, again, I'm not trying to beat those up that have been divorced. But I'll fight to my death to keep a struggling marriage together. Our kids, kids need us to make it. They need us to figure it out. They need us to keep striving, not give up. Keep moving forward. 
Our title today is There's Many Ways to Be a Great Dad or a Good Dad. I actually said good, but it came out great on the, on the flyer thing, so it's okay. Because I think some of us are scared we're never going to be a good dad, much less a great one. But either way, let's work on it. But see, some of us have the notion that to be a great dad or a good dad is to be independently wealthy, athletic, good looking, able to buy your kids anything they need, want for success in their own lives. And uh, they coach the Little League, and they win the championship. They coach midget football, and they win the championship. And they do all these cool things, and they drive the really cool cars, have the really nice house, house and the vacation house, and the boat, and, and the motorcycle, and the, the side-by-sides, and all those stuff we all love to have. And once you accumulate all that, your kids will be successful, and everything's going to be okay, and you're going to be a successful dad. That's a lie. I'll never forget, and, and my dad worked. If, if anybody taught me work ethics, my dad, he worked all the time. And he would always say, I'm working to get you some of that stuff you like. And I remember one time, and I don't remember how old I was, and dad remembers it well, but I looked at him and said, Dad, I really don't care about stuff, but I'd really like to go fishing with you today. I didn't need a boat, Kim. Let's go stand on the pond bank. Let's, let's drown some worms, Dad. Let's just hang out. Go to football. He didn't like football. My love of life was football. He hated football. He was jealous of my football. He asked me one day, I'm going to call your coach and see if he can get you to mow the grass. I mowed the grass. <laughs> I didn't want him calling my coach. Listen, folks, Dad, we just sometimes just show up. And, 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 and what Marisa would tell me every once in a while, yeah, you're here, but you're not here. Oh, that hurt, Lori. I was like, well, I got a lot on my mind. Well, clear your mind. Your kids need you. Okay. I was right. And isn't it funny how sometimes it's the little things? My daughter to this day still likes daddy-daughter dates. Right before she married John, she called me, or she told me on Monday, she said, Dad, Thursday night, me and you are going out. We're having daddy-daughter date. I'm like, no, we're not. Thursday night was a late night. We were still working till 8 o'clock at Tom Hall's. If you think I'm going out after 8 on a Thursday, you've lost your ever love of mine. And she kept up. Finally, Thursday, Marisa called me. She goes, you do know you're going with your daughter to Olive Garden tonight. No, I'm not. I'm pouting. I'm like, oh, it's too late. Too late. Yes, sir, I was. <laughs> About 8.15. Maybe you let me go early. Amen. I don't remember. But I had daddy-daughter to eight. And I was, oh, my God. I was like, and she just started talking and talking and talking. And I was like, Randy Davis, you're an idiot. <coughs> you have a young adult daughter that wants to come and eat dinner with her dad and have a conversation. And you almost passed on it. You're an idiot. And she talked to me and told me things. And I sat there and my chest just popped out. I was like, whoa. And I almost missed it, Dick, because I was too tired. I worked all day. Listen, guys, find some extra energy. Find some, take some Geritol, whatever you need. But we got to go. <laughs> we got to do it. They even have that stuff anymore. I don't know, but. <coughs> See, I don't believe you have to be the little league coach to be a great dad, but you better be at the ball game and have some ice cream after. You don't have to be the coach. And sometimes you just can't be at a game. Find a way to make sure they know you want to be. Love them enough to teach them a work ethic and how to provide for themselves someday. Or they'll live off of you the rest of their life. It's a true story. A great dad spends time with his kids. He involves them in his life and his projects. I'll never forget when my dad told me this. He said, son, if you'll let them help you when they're little, they might want to help you when they're big. And there were days, you know good and well, Eric, you can do it a lot faster if they're not hands all in it. But by golly, someday you're going to need their hands in it. They're going to look at you like, you never let me help me before. Why do you need me now? True story. So involve them now. 
Life for a Christian is serving others. Nothing more, nothing less. Of all the things we should teach our kids, let's teach our kids to serve others. Some kids, the only time they'll serve somebody else is, how much am I getting paid? That's a sorry way to live life, man. The best serving you ever do is when you ain't getting nothing for it but the joy of helping somebody. Teach your kids how to do that. I used to pray it every day. God, let them love you and serve you and your people every day of their life. I still pray it over them, and they're grown. But I pray that we teach our kids to serve others. I got a list of 10 ways to be a good dad. Number one, love your wife. I explained that earlier. It's pretty self-explanatory. But kids get great security when they know mom and dad's in love. No greater security to give your kids. Spend time with your kids. Again, self-explanatory, guys. If you want to be a good dad, a great dad, spend time with them. Drop what you're doing some days and say, you know what? Yeah, the grass is high, but my kids need me to play in that grass with them. Let's go play. And I think some of us as grandparents, it's like a do-over button. You're smiling. It's true, ain't it? Like, I can do things now because nothing else matters. I've gotten to the point in life, if Lance and these grandpa, grandpa's showing up. It won't be long the mother to start asking for stuff. I got a hand on the wallet, but they got their fingers in it. I guarantee it. There's nothing better. And there are little smiles, and you notice so much more than all your own kids. I think when you have your own kids, you're just trying to stay awake. <laughs> you know, it's so tired. Grandparents are like, dude, who needs sleep? I'm good. Sometimes it's not always spending time with your kids, but just try to call them, check on them. Say, hey, how you doing? I miss you. I love you. Find those small pockets of time. It don't have to be a huge vacation, just some time together. Thirdly, please be a role model. It's impossible to underestimate the power dad has over his kids in being a role model. I remember one time Robert said to me, well, dad, you did that. <laughs> Crud. <laughs> I should have been so transparent at church. <laughs> yeah, sis, I did, and I paid a great price. How much are you willing to pay? But, Dad, I said, I'm just telling you, you don't make bad choices, you're going to reap some harvest. Yours may be worse than mine. Well, you said you never got caught. Oh, I got caught. Trust me. Not in the same way. Are you a man of your word? Brighton, I, I tell you what, you never told that boy, Thursday night, we're going to go do so-and-so. Because if you, I don't care if it was outside and there's a tornado coming through town, we still got to go do that. But dad, you said, I was like, oh my God, son, it's pouring down rain. We can't. Dad, you said it. You lied to me. <sighs> I know y'all can't see him being belligerent like that, but he was. Oh, my goodness. I can't wait till he makes a promise to Isla. And she goes, but, Dad, you said. <laughs> Brutal. I used to, I'd find every adjective before maybe that I could come up with. If it's not terrible weather and everything works out okay, we might go Friday. Dad, you said we might go. It's perfect weather. What's your excuse? Oh, my goodness. He was terrible at that. Understand your children. That's hard. Man, they're in high school. They change every day. Holy smokes. Like, well, I thought you... I, huh, uh, oh, why? That's why we got to stay in tune with them every day. Because they're like this. Or like this. You got to stay on the train with them. It's, it's a rough ride. But you want to know who they're hanging out with. You need to hear what they're saying without saying it. That's hard. But guys, we got to figure out what our children need most from us and work on it real hard. See, one may need encouragement. The other responds better with affection. But with that crucial understanding, we can make a big difference in the lives of our kids. 
And I know a lot of dads that maybe don't show affection, especially to their daughters. But I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't, some ugly guy will. Hello. Just saying. Show affection. That's number five. Children long for a secure place in this crazy, fast-paced world we live in. They find it most often in the warm embrace of a parent. And guys, don't let mom get all the credit for loving on them. Get your fair share. As children grow, so does their need for acceptance and sense of belonging. And I heard a principal say in Frankfort, Kentucky, parents need not to believe the junior high lie. And I said, what in the world is the junior high lie? He said, the lie is that when they get in junior high, they're too cool for hugs and kisses when you drop them off for school. He said, my daughter's a senior. I hug and kiss her every day. And I embarrass the snot out of her. He goes, but you know what she's really saying when she walks across that yard? And I think she's thinking I'm embarrassed. She's going, my dad still loves me. Maybe nobody else in this school does. My daddy still loves me. Don't believe the junior high lie. Whoa. He told me that, and I didn't even have a kid yet. I'm glad he told me that. I've seen it. I remember both of mine. Dad, can you drop me off over here? <laughs> I was like, nope. Run door. Love on them. Kiss them. Hug them. There's no better way to feel secure than in a daddy's hug kind word expressions of appreciation fellas we can do this and don't let your affection stop there make sure you tell them you love them don't let them assume it I can't tell you how many people I've heard I didn't hear my dad say he loved me until he was like 65 years old what fellas of all the people they need to hear that from it should be us and number six, enjoy your children. Dads, I've never been to a dance recital, but I hear they're wonderful. My brother-in-law has two granddaughters <laughs> that he has to go watch, and he's told me about it. But see, I think so many times when we're at the game, it's all about the competition and the ribbons and how they place and where they fit. What about just the fun of being involved in something? Of all the people that should keep that grounded for our kids should be parents. But, you know, they say so many dads especially live out their, their athletic fantasies through their children, especially if they were a nerd and their kids are actually athletic. <laughs> Man, I think the best part of playing sports is being on a team, learning to work together, having some fun. I mean, if I wanted my kids to be on a successful team, I might not have moved them out to Allen East. I'm just saying. Ryden said in one year of college football, he had won more games than he did his whole career of high school. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? He had a blast. And that's what it's about. So enjoy them. Spend time with them. Build a fort with them. Have a pretend tea party with your daughter. Oh, those were awkward. Especially when she wanted to just sit in a little chair that was built for a doll. Look at me. I'm like, sweetheart, I better sit on the ground. I don't want to break your chair, you know. And you hold your finger up with her, you know, and drink your tea. Wow. This is one Auburn I'll never forget. She's in junior high. She says, why don't we ever sit at the table and eat together? Ugh. Eat together as a family. Some of you are like us. You come in in shifts. You eat in shifts. I get it. But boy, the days that we can, we should have a meaningful time of sitting at that table. Statistically, they tell us that families that eat dinner together five or more days a week have some of the most well-behaved, well-balanced children, period. And it's because we sit together, we eat together, we talk together. We find out more about our kids. But I know it's hard. It's crazy work. Again, she would get on to us. We never eat at the table. I like the TV. I like the TV tray. This is where I sit. This is what I like. What they needed, Dad, turn the TV off. Enough of that. Number eight, discipline with a gentle spirit.
True discipline is a function of a father's love for his children, which is why it should never be hard-nosed or harsh. Discipline's role is not to intimidate or tear down, but to mold and to correct. Correcting your kids should be done in private, and you and your wife should be unified in how you will discipline and strive to be consistent. Don't base your discipline on the bad day that you've had, and that's hard. And some of us only know how to be disciplined or to discipline the way we were disciplined. And maybe we weren't taught well. We've got to get better. Number nine, this is not last by any means, but pray and worship together. Family that does have a, prayer, a healthy prayer life and take worshiping God seriously, seriously help children to understand that there's an ultimate authority in their lives. An authority who provides moral absolutes for them to live by. Every child needs to know that there is right and there is wrong. There is good and there is evil. Living under the authority of God will give them that knowledge. And last but not least, realize you're a father forever. Someday every father must let go of the youthful activities that bond him with his children. But a good father realizes that as he allows his children their freedom to direct their own lives, he doesn't abandon them at a dorm room, a wedding altar, or at the door of their first job. He continues to encourage, coach, and convey his wisdom to his children forever. I remember I was at a uh, FCA coaches conference, and I was hosting it, and they brought in a speaker from a big church up in Michigan. And he was talking about a buddy of his uh, I never think of his name, but he, he does uh, marriage and parenting counseling, and he's, he's a great author, speaker. And he said they were riding in a car, and he was talking to his son on the phone. And, and he says, you know, I'm, the, I'm a successful pastor. I help people with their marriages. I help people with their kids. And, and I've got this great counselor that I can use if I need him. And, and we're driving down the road, and I'm talking to my son. I get off the phone. He goes, let me ask you a question. And I looked at him, and I said, yeah, what? He goes, how old's your son? He goes, 25. He goes, when are you going to quit parenting him and be his friend? At the exact same moment I'm sitting there, Bryden was about 23. And I remember the conversation I'd had earlier where I was parenting him. And I wasn't listening to him. I wasn't being a friend to him. And he said to him, he said, at some point you've got to shift gears. You can no longer parent them and have them under you. You've got to let them fly. And you've got to let them do what they need to do. You're there to just be a friend, to listen They already know what they need to do because you taught them. But it's time you quit teaching them and let them figure it out for themselves. And I remember leaving there going, "Uh uh-oh, I need to have a conversation with my son. There's a gear change that happens at some point, but we're always a father. And fellas, whether you feel you've been good at it or you haven't been so good at it, as long as there's breath, there's hope, hope to get better. Well, it's too late, it's too late, it's too late. No, it's never too late. God wants to use you. And sometimes it's not even about fathering our own kids. Folks, we father a lot of kids. We mentor a lot of kids. We, we have influence over several people we don't even realize. I was at a wedding last night, and a gentleman walked up to me, and I've done both of his daughter's weddings. He has a son that's not married yet. And he said, you know, me and my wife just sit there talking. He goes, how many Alanese kids have you done their weddings? I, I don't have any idea. He goes, man, we just want to thank you. You've had a great... He said, we never attended your church yet. Both of my daughters wanted you to do their wedding. Thank you for influencing my kids. He gave me a big hug. And I thought, wow. I didn't even think about it. I just do weddings. That's what we do. But in his mind, I'd encourage his girls in such a way from not even being their pastor. They wanted me to do their wedding. Like, thank you, God. Fellas, don't give up. You have a chance to get better. And those of you that have had a bad situation with your own dad and you don't really, like you say, Dad, I love you, and Dad, I, I'm whatever, and Happy Father's Day, but you don't mean it, let God work on you so you can mean it again. Let God heal pain. Take the hurt away. I know it's hard. I don't know what some of you have been through, and I know Father's Day, like Mother's Day, can have all kind of connotation. I get it. But dads, don't get so narrow-minded in your focus of how to be a good or a great dad that you always feel like a failure. There's many ways, many ways to be a good or a great dad. 
do what you're good at. If my kid has to depend on me to help learn how to turn wrenches, I'm in trouble. I'm thankful for my buddy Vinny. I'll just send him over there. Vinny will teach you how to turn them wrenches. And Vinny may not know something I know, and he may send his kid to me, and I'll help him out. Because I can't be good at everything. I'm not good at very much of anything. That's beside the point. Matt knows how to fix anything. He's one of those guys, you know, like, wow. But if I can't be like Matt, I must be a failure as a father. But maybe I can do some things Matt can't do. Quit comparing. Stop it. Be the best you can with what God's offered you. I'd like all the men to stand and come up front, all the, all the men and all the fathers. And if you're 18 or above, I want you to join us. I know you're not a dad yet, but we want to give you something anyway. Because the best time to plan to be a great father is before you are a great, before you are a father. Amen? Reach in that bag right there and start passing out some of them gifts. You do the same over here, Mr. Sloan. Dick, you want to start in that bag. Give those guys a gift. We got a little gift for you. Lori picked this out. I like it. Every man needs a multi-tool in his pocket. Be careful. This one will paint you. But uh, the reason I like the multi-tool, and I changed the sermon, same way this is many things you can do with this little dude, there's many ways to be a great dad. You're not a failure, man. You may have failed. You may have had days you felt like you just totally missed it. So have I. Many times. But I'm stubborn enough. I'm not going to quit. And if you see me quitting, Eric, come after me. Two doors away. Two doors away. <laughs> Eric's the other way. I got two Eric's looking out for me. They're both meaner than me. Fellas, listen, we can't quit. It's a new day. Many ways. Be a great father, great grandfather. Never give up. Never stop. This wants to be, I want to be a church. No offense to the ladies. But in most churches, 80% of the work done is done by the women. Truth. And therefore, churches are seen as very effeminate. Well, if women are leading everything, it's going to be, have a woman's touch on it. No offense. But I want a man church where men know how to lead. They can share leadership with the women. They can do things together. But I want men to feel at home here. I want us to do manly things. I want us to go trap shooting and canoeing and hunting, fishing, doing man things, whatever that is. Fix a car. Fix a house. Listen to me. Don't let the ladies have all the fun. Volunteer, help out. Get involved with our kids. Schools are full of women teachers. Less and less men teachers. Bass schools has one of the biggest ratios of men teachers. It's incredible. I love it. We should be involved. Raising the kids. Amen? Let me pray for you. Father, thanks for our men. Especially our fathers. God, there's so many times that our self-talk is defeating. We feel like we don't measure up. We can't be what everybody else is. Maybe our job or occupation takes a lot more time than others. But God, for us, we have to get more creative with the time we do have. Give us strength. Give us wisdom. Give us energy. God, it takes a lot of energy to be a good dad. God, help us to be selfless and yet take care of ourselves, because that too is being an example to our kids. I pray, God, that for the dad that feels like he's missed it, give him hope today. And God, for those that are listening today that don't have a great relationship with their dad, I know I can relate. In a long time, Lord, there was bad feelings and hurt and pain. But God, help them with your help forgive their father to let it go I pray a blessing over this day I pray that you'll keep us all safe but you'll let us have a great day 
enjoying in the weather that you blessed us with. And bring us back to the point of time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Make it a great day. Have some fun. And uh, we'll see you next Sunday. And if your dad's up here, love on him. Give him a hug. Ain't Egypt. <laughs>